We're going to talk about recent events. And as hard as I tried this week to, to not have that be on, in my heart and on my mind, the Lord really impressed on me that we need to talk about what the Lord did and what the Lord didn't do and to answer some questions because there's a lot of questions out there, even amongst believers, as to why didn't God, and then you can fill in the rest. Well, we're going to look to explore those this morning. So before we would get into God's Word, let's take and ask Him to bless this time of study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before You. And Lord, we just ask that You would open our hearts and minds to receive what You have for us today. Lord, we turn to You because there's no other place to turn. Lord, there's no other place, no other source of peace, no other source of comfort, no other source of wisdom and knowledge and, and justice, mercy and grace. So, Lord, we lay ourselves at your throne, asking that you would provide to us in our hearts and into our minds that which we need, Lord, to sustain us in you. And, Lord, also to make us a voice to this world, to this nation that is desperately crying out for answers. The answer to why. So, Lord, we ask. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week has been a shock there's been disbelief, one of great mourning and great loss. These horrific events in Las Vegas rocked our world and will forever change how we look at our lives. The brutal and senseless murder of 58 people, the wounding of hundreds more in what is the single largest mass killing in American history. The killer, a 64-year-old retired accountant who managed to carry over 20 weapons and thousands of rounds of ammunition up to the 32nd floor of a Las Vegas hotel. His intent, well, obvious, to kill as many innocent people as he could before taking his own life. Thousands, if not millions across the world, will be deeply affected for the rest of their lives. The most serious, well, the most serious pain belongs to those who experience the horror firsthand. What do we say to them? What can we learn from these events, and how can we answer the question, why? Oh, in looking at the commentary, the search for a reason for the answer to why is sadly predictable. It's our nature when we face something like this to look for a reason, to have a place to bl place blame, to, to try to make sense out of that which is senseless. I mean, what would cause a seemingly good average guy to do such an evil thing? What would cause someone to just snap, to just lose it and, and lose all sense of right and wrong in the midst of the pain we desperately need to answer the question, why? Some of the first reports, well, they sought to blame the events on terrorism. I've got to be honest with you, in my own heart, I kind of hope that that's what it was. I mean, in a sick and a perverse way, we live in a community, we live in a, in a society to where those types of acts, at least because of the ideology behind them, are somewhat explainable. Well, it didn't take very long before we started realizing that the shooter didn't fit the profile, that the narrative wouldn't support that it was a terrorist attack, at least not of an ideological means. Next came the commentary on, well, mental health problems. And we all know that there's a problem with the lack of mental health programs to help those that are suffering. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you follow the news at all, you know his dad had problems in that area too, you know. The apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. The problem was is that this guy didn't seem to have any apparent problems. He hadn't hit anybody's radar. He hadn't been through any type of counseling. He didn't seem to have a dysfunction. He looked basically normal, maybe a little odd, but... Look left and right. <laughs> then we heard that he was a radical white supremacist. That didn't fit the narrative because most of the time white supremacists don't shoot up country concerts. <laughs> oh, but then he became a democratic left-winger, an Antifa supporter. Well, that was quickly debunked as well. And of course, before the scene was even cleared, the gun control advocates came out calling for the confiscation of all guns and the repeal of the Second Amendment. 
The commentary will continue for months, maybe years. And in the absence of some kind of direct evidence produced by the shooter himself, it will continue to be fodder for any and all sides. There'll be conspiracy theorists, terrorism experts, racial dividers, mental health advocates, gun control lobbyists, and even religious groups that will chime in all different ideologies and venues seeking a spot at the table to venue or the venue to support their point of view. And while we may never know or be able to assign a specific reason for this horrific attack, there is something with almost certainty that I can say you won't hear outside of the church. What you won't hear is that this was a great evil caused by the sin in the heart of man. What you won't hear is that there's a master manipulator and an organizer named Satan that capitalizes on man's sinful nature and prompts him to act out that nature in horrific ways. And it's the lack of acknowledging that there is a Satan that will allow him to continue to prompt these acts almost undetected, especially by those who they affect the most and those who are willingly blind. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to look at how as Christians we need to review and we need to respond to the world around us. How we need to help each other to answer and to cope. And then especially how we're to answer and help those outside the church see what is really happening. We need to answer the question, why? In order to do so, the first thing that we have to do as believers is clearly identify that there are great obstacles in identifying how it is that evil even exists. The world says that people are basically good at heart. Have you heard that? Heard that? Hear people say, oh, everybody's good deep down. Oh, that means that just the evil's on the surface, right? <laughs> the world will say that people are good at heart and they only act bad because of some negative influence that's been brought upon them from the outside. The worldview, well, since people are good, in order for them to do something bad, they must have a reason. There must be a cause. There must be a catalyst. It could be that maybe they were abused as a child. Maybe they were raised in a fatherless home or in poverty, or that they needed some sort of treatment of mental illness that went undetected. Maybe they were victims of racial bigotry or had medical needs that were neglected. Maybe they were radicalized by some ideology that turned them from being good to evil. In any case, the world always wants to find the cause coming from the outside in when it comes to evil. Now, before you think that I'm somewhat insensitive or that I don't understand the issues that people face and the conditions that add to these problems, don't mishear me. Yes, there are factors that contribute to evil in our society. Yes, there have been people who have been victims of unimaginable abuse and neglect. But guys, this is not the root of the problem. But more so, these are symptoms of a more basic truth. God has told us what the problem is. And guys, the simple truth is that we are not good people being forced to do bad things because of our circumstances. Rather, we are bad people who will act like bad people when left to our own devices. I didn't say it. God said it. If you're going to get mad and send mail, send it to God. <laughs> but in Genesis 6, 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of his thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Psalm 53 and 1 says, A fool has said in his heart that there is no God. They are corrupt and they have done abominable things. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek Him. Every one of them is turned aside and they have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 says, For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Roman tells us that there are none who understand. 
There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. And again, there is none who does good. No, not one. Jeremiah 17.9. And you're familiar with this one. The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. Who can know it? Oh, that could continue on. I could read many, many more that gives us the perspective and see God's clear declaration. And if the God that created us, if the God who made us has looked within us and into our hearts and said, your heart is wicked, then how can we expect to ever find good in that which contains no good? Man on his own cannot generate good no matter how hard we try. All the good acts of mankind, well, they're always overshadowed by the intent of the heart, aren't they? I mean, you know what I mean. Even the most loving, even the kindest person that you could meet, will, if they were willing to be honest, would shock you with the thoughts of violence and evil that runs through and between their ears. If your pastor told you some of the thoughts that I have sometime that happen in the gray matter between these ears on the side of my head, you would go... <gasps> I'm not going to that church anymore. <laughs> Until you realize that you have the same thoughts. Isn't it amazing? I will, I will be driving down the road and all of a sudden it's like, ah! Where did that come from? As if it flew in the window and sucked into my brain. No, hopefully it came through my brain and sucked out through the windows. But many of you would say, well, Pastor, to have a bad thought is a long, long way from committing violent and murderous acts. The question is, is it really? I mean, Jesus himself, in, in putting things into perspective, declared that physical acts against the law are equal to the acts that happen in the mind and in the heart. You see, sin starts in the mind of man and then it moves to the heart. And if not restrained, if not brought under control, we'll act on it. We will. Most people, sin starts in the mind, moves to the heart, and then there's hopefully something that holds it back. Oh, it could be reason. It could be conscience. It could be the fear of consequence. You know, most people recognize that to do something illegal or immoral or just flat out wrong carries with it a consequence, and most people, most, are not willing to suffer the consequence. There's a reason that we don't have a whole rash of bank robbers in the room. Some of you have looked at the consequence and the potential gain and figured, hey, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to go to prison. I've seen all those movies. It's not a nice place. So I'll choose not to do that. But at the same time, the problem is, is that so often the restraint that we have, the thing that holds us back, is only because of the fear of discovery. Not too long ago, Barna did a poll where they went out and they interviewed just random men on the street and asked them if it was possible as a married man, if you could have a affair with another woman and there was absolutely no way that anyone would find out about it your wife your friends it would be as if it never happened would you do it how many do you think said yes not all Ninety-nine point nine. Seventy-five percent. Seventy-five percent of the men that were pulled in, they didn't ask them if they were Christians or not. They didn't ask them if they had any religious beliefs. They didn't ask them any. They just said, if you could do that and have it be totally undetected and nobody would know. Three out of four men said, yeah, I'd do that. You see, it's not the fear of consequence based on a moral factor or based on something that is restraining us because we're good, we just don't want to get caught. 
We just don't want to do something and have it, have it be exposed to the point that we have to suffer the consequences for it. Now for the Christian, our hope, our restraint comes from the Holy Spirit. That's where our restraint comes. But again, it's a hope. It's not a promise. It's not a guarantee. Because we can, at any given time, override conscience, consequence, morality, the Holy Spirit through our own will and through our own determination. So the first point in the answering of why is, and I'm hoping that you guys kind of get it, you're not a good person. Sorry. If there is any good, it's because of the God that is dwelling within you. But there's not any good that came on board with you. But what's even harder is, is that if we recognize that, if we realize that, if we accept that, if we're okay with that as our understanding and our baseline, then it asks even a bigger question. Then since God created us and He allows this sin nature, why doesn't He just stop it? I mean, after all, if God is really good, why doesn't He just step in and stop sin? Why doesn't He just step in and stop evil? I mean, after all, why doesn't God do something? Oh, don't think you won't be asked that question. Don't think that you haven't thought that question at one point in time. It's a good question. As a matter of fact, it's a great question. It has a very simple answer, but we need to break it down. First, understand that the fact that sin exists is not a failing on God's part. I'm going to repeat that because you need to understand this. The fact that sin exists is not a failing on God's part. Rather, it's a demonstration of God's love for us. Oh, now stay with me because some of you are going, ah, ah, ah. How can the existence of sin represent the love of God? Well, God's ultimate expression of love comes through your ability, through my ability, to exercise free will. You see, that is the ultimate expression of love. God's desire is for us to love Him of our own free will. And we, we need to understand that He's not there looking for us to love Him based on no choice, but on completely open and free choice. You know, there's no way to make or to force someone to love you. Think about your relationships for a moment. Those that you really love and you really care for. I mean, why do you love them? Is it because you don't have a choice or because you choose to? Now be careful, because I know instantly some of you went to relatives. Some of you are thinking, well, they're family. I have to love them. Oh, well, be careful because what you're manufacturing may not actually be love. It just may look like extreme tolerance. <laughs> now, see, in order to love someone, in order to really invest and to love them, it has to be completely freely given. Agreed? Then that's how we see God treating us. Because see, if I wanted to try to force the issue, we might be able to take, if we were so inclined, and try to control someone's behavior. We could create an environment by which they would have to comply or suffer some sort of physical or maybe emotional abuse. We could create compliance by threat or by force, but it would never be love. Rather, the response would come more in the form of based in fear, or worse, some sort of mental or physical driven need for survival, but it certainly would not be love. And because God loves us, He won't put us under that kind of pressure. See, the bottom line is that love is only love when it is freely given. And so God doesn't force Himself on us. He allows us the freedom to love Him or not to love Him based on our will. And it's exactly the same way with sin. You see, we have a choice. God didn't create sin. He doesn't promote sin. He doesn't direct sin. God allows sin because He allows us the choice to sin or not. 
You see, and it's important that we understand it because many people think, well, well, God must be evil because God is doing these things. Guys, God's not doing it. But His love for us allows us to. And it breaks His heart. Now, understand, I know, and I mean, I, I know, I don't even just believe this. I know that there are times when God intervenes in the situations supernaturally. I know that there have been times in my life where God has pushed evil aside or held it back for a period in order that I could slide by and not be affected by. I know that God chooses when He does to intervene. The problem is, though, is that we cannot demand that God intervene in all acts of evil because in order to do so, He would have to stop loving us. Often when something like this happens, a horrific event, people have a tendency to blame God for not acting. Why didn't God stop this? Why didn't God cause the the gun to jam? Or why didn't God just reach down and snatch that guy out of that hotel room and fling him out the window? Why didn't He do something? I mean, oh my goodness, the horror! God is truly good. Shouldn't he have done something to prevent this terrible tragedy? My question when this line of thought comes up is to always ask the person asking, and guys, this is going to happen. If it hasn't happened yet in the workplace, amongst your friends, amongst your family, it's going to. And this is one of the reasons you need to be prepared to answer this question. Because they're going to come and they're going to ask, Why didn't God stop this? And the question to respond to them with is, is that really the type of God that you would serve? Would you really serve a God that would intervene and stop all sin? Well, yes. Okay. Then where does He start? And where does He stop? Oh, no, we could take a survey, and we could probably, most of us, if not all of us in this room, we could come up with a list of things, a list of sins, a list of horrific acts that we could all agree God needs to stop. We can start with murder. Yes, there you go. Number one on the list, let's say God, God just stop all murder. All right, well, then let's move on to rape, and let's move on to child abuse, and let's move on to elder abuse, and then let's go to robbery, and why stop there? Let's just get God to step in, not just on the biggies, but let's get Him to stop lying and cheating and and stop those that are just, well, just being mean. How about drunk drivers? Drug addicts? What about just thinking a bad thought? Wouldn't it be good if when when the second somebody thought a bad thought, God would just come down and squish them like a bug? Yeah. Yeah. Get those bad thinking people. How about just plain being stupid? I mean, you kind of see, <laughs> we, 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 we wouldn't be here <laughs> if that was the way God treated us. If we want God to stop all sin, He would have to take away our free will, and in taking away our free will, He would stop loving us. Is that really the kind of God that we want to serve? Is that that the kind of God that we would would say, oh yes! Again, the very fact that God allows sins is the ultimate proof of His love for us. So we see how it works. We can talk in answer responsibly why bad things happen to not so good people. Oh, I know it sounds harsh because those people were truly innocent of any cause in relationship to the act that was perpetrated against them. So that part is true. They didn't provoke it. They didn't create the situation. But bad things happen because people are sinful and are not naturally good. Point one. Next thing to keep in mind is that bad things happen because there is a real enemy of man. Satan is real. His number one job description is to kill and to destroy the creation of God. 
Bad things happen because if left unrestrained, the evil thoughts in the heart and the mind of man become actions. And bad things happen because, well, God allows us to make choices rather than to control us. And bad things happen because God loves us and allows us to either love Him or not. So as we get to this understanding, it still brings about another question. If God is not going to step in and stop all evil, then what is He going to do about this? Is God going to do anything other than just observe? Again, great question. See, the questions aren't wrong. The questions aren't bad. The problem is is that the questions that are being asked that are trying to be answered in the world will never fulfill. They will never answer responsibly because it doesn't matter what this guy's ideology was. It doesn't matter if he had accomplices. It doesn't matter what was going on in his mind at the time. It was evil. It was in his heart. It was unrestrained. And he acted on it. That's what matters. To know that that's where it comes from. Guys, the first thing that we need to realize in relationship to what is God doing about this is first to understand that God is in control. He's in control. And while it breaks his heart, this didn't surprise him. It didn't catch him off guard. God is not unaware of what's happening. And in fact, God has already listened God has already judged the sin of the world. It's already judged. And He's judged and determined that the wages of that sin, the penalty of that sin, is death. What this means, with, along with being a loving God, is that He's also a just and righteous God. God would not be just if He didn't judge sin, but rather allowed it to go unchecked. And you see, part of the answer of what God is doing about evil in the world is that sin has already been judged. And those who reject God and do evil will be punished for all of eternity. Oh, it's often about this time that if they're really thinking about it in the midst of the conversation, that somebody will ask, okay, great, so let me see if I've got this right. God has given us free will that starts with our sin nature. And if we act on that sin nature, then the wages of that sin is death. So basically what you're telling me is that God has set us up for failure. We're born sinners. We act on that sin. The punishment is death. Wow. Sounds like a really good and great loving God. It would seem very unfair, very unloving, if that is where God left it. But He didn't. Turn with me to chapter 3, the book of John. John's Gospel, chapter 3. For the men in the group that didn't catch that, that's John chapter 3. That's way your wife doesn't have to tell you twice. <laughs> Chapter 3, book of John, first verse says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered again and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said to you, you must be born again. Guys, because of God's great love for us, He's provided a way that we can be born again. When we're born again in, in, in such a way, through the power of God, we are 
able to put off that original sin nature that has overcome us and able to dwell and function in the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be free from the power that sin has in our lives, which means that as believers, we don't have to sin. We can be free from that power. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 says this. It says, Therefore, from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we see Him thus no longer. Listen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, through Christ Jesus, through accepting Him, the salvation that He brings, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, you can be brand new. How many of you in here got an old version and a new version? Right? I like the new and improved version. Right? It's so much better than the old version. But not only has He provided us with the ability to be new, but He's also provided us with the means by which we can be forgiven of that sin debt that leads to death. Oh, you know it. We're in the chapter. We have to go there. Verse 16. Chapter 3 of John. And when you say it like that, you go, huh? No, John 3, 16. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know that one. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, normally that's about as far as people go, but you need to continue on into verse 18. For he who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, the basis for everything that God does is His great love for us. Evil exists in the world because man is not good to begin with, and we're born with this sin nature, and without restraint, we act on the nature. God's love is demonstrated by His willingness to allow us the choice to love Him or not. God is just because He has already judged sin and determined the sentence to be death. But God didn't set us up for failure. You see, God so loves us that He provided the means by which we can be born again. We can receive a new nature. A nature that's guided and directed by the Spirit of God and one that is able to overcome the power of sin in the guiding of our lives. And that God so loves us that He sent His Son Jesus to pay the price for that sin. Allowing us to be forgiven. Allowing us to receive eternal life. And so now with this is our understanding. What are we supposed to do when things like this happen? I mean, I mean okay, I, I, I get it. I understand. In some ways today, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are all here at church because you came to church. You didn't think you were going out to eat and somebody shanghaied you. The first thing that we have to do is we have to stop looking for the answer to why evil exists. It's our nature. You know, years ago, and some of you know this, years ago I, I uh, taught police academies. And as part of our academy in talking about those that have a predisposition to, to, to do crime, we, we used an analogy, or I came up with this little story about a snake handler. And the idea was is that this guy was handling some of the most deadliest snakes ever known to man. And he was milking these things on a weekly basis to get their venom in order to create antitoxins and antivenoms. But there was one snake in the, in the place that it didn't matter. They needed the, the venom for other toxins or antitoxins, but his bite was deadly every time. No possible antidote. And so for years, this guy handled this snake, and he'd come up with some close calls on other snakes, but this snake, for some reason, every time that he would approach the cage, the snake would go over and put its head in a corner of the cage, and he would just wait for the guy to put the hook on the back of his head and reach in and grab him and then bring him over and, and milk him and put him back, and the snake was just compliant. 
The snake never acted out, never got aggressive. As a matter of fact, the guy almost kind of thought, hey, he's my buddy. Me and the snake are friends because he, he's compliant. Every time I walk over, he goes over, sticks his head in the thing. I put the hook on the back of his head. I reach in and I grab him. I milk him. I put him back. I feed him. I take care of him. We're, we're okay. I don't know why everybody's so afraid of the snake. Well, one day, out of all of the days, he broke his protocol. And not thinking, he was a little in, a, in a little hurry, he was running behind a little bit, he opens the cage, and without putting the hook in on the back of the snake's head before he reached in, he just reached in. And the second that he did, the snake turned around and bit him. Shocked. Completely disbelieving what just happened. He looks at the snake and he goes, Why? <laughs> Why? I've been taking care of you for years. We've been going through this routine every single day. Why now? Why would you do this? The snake just turned and looked at him. And he said, it's my nature. I'm a snake. And guys, that's what we're up against and we have to understand when we're dealing with the things of the world, when we're dealing with this type of evil. It's the nature of that we're dealing with. And there's only one solution to a nature that has been born, and that is to be reborn. And that only happens through Jesus Christ. Instead of asking why when man's nature displays itself, we need to move past the question of why and say, since this has happened, what do we do now? What do we do now? You see, why never satisfies? Why never brings a conclusion? Even if we knew why, it wouldn't matter. Still horrific, still terrible, still doesn't make any sense. And if this guy came out and said, yes, I did it because I worshiped the banana God and the banana God told me to do this. Oh, that's why. It wouldn't matter. You see, the only question that why can answer is more questions. The only thing that it satisfies is nothing in our hearts. But now that this has happened, the question that will bring comfort is what do we do now? Lord, since this has happened, and guys, this applies in our lives, whether it be on the scale of something like, like this that happened in Las Vegas or something that is an individual tragedy in our lives. The question is not to ask why. The question is to ask, what do I do now? In this case, what brings hope? It brings comfort. For now, as believers in Jesus Christ, our first action in this case should be to provide comfort to those that are suffering. Our first action in this should be to hold those up that have been brutally victimized by this event. We need to reach out with compassion to the hurting and to the broken and provide love and support and direct them to the God that loves and supports them. We need to uphold those that believe because guys understand that just because somebody calls themselves a Christian doesn't mean that they really are in a place to understand the things of God. And so we need to encourage each other. We need to uphold each other. We need to be those that are exhorting and comforting because I don't know about you, but this thing is just a mess. We need to come together for prayer. We need to have opportunities to fellowship and to support each other in the love of the Lord. For those that don't know the Lord, we need to, with great love, with great compassion, lead them to Jesus Christ and the salvation that comes through His sacrifice might come in the form of meeting a physical or an emotional need. Allowing folks to come to grips with what's happened, but the key is to love them with the same love that Jesus Christ has loved us. We need to show them that God didn't fail. We need to let them understand that He didn't fail them and He didn't fail their loved ones and that Jesus is the proof of a loving God. And most of all, guys, most of all, we need to refrain from letting the political and the cultural false narratives draw us away from what really matters. I get so aggravated when there is such a, 
a distraction from what counts. And well-meaning, good-hearted believers in Jesus Christ find that the only thing that they can make an argument for comes in a political or a cultural venue rather than arguing for the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ. Guys, we need to put that noise away. It's not going to solve anything. Oh, they, they decide to come from our, for our guns? We'll figure it out at that point in time. From my cold, dead hand. But see, that's not the issue. This isn't a gun issue. This isn't a political issue. This isn't a left issue. This isn't a right issue. This isn't a, an Antifa issue. This isn't a white supremacy. This isn't any kind of issue other than a sin issue in the heart of man. And the only thing that is going to stop and change the sin in the heart of man is Jesus Christ. You've got to change it from the inside out, not from the outside in. And that's our job. You see, you guys just all applaud it because you agree. Oh, pastor, that's great. Go get them. No, you go get them. <laughs> that's our job. That's our calling. Oh, you mean we can't go rail against the other side? No, no, no. Go love the other side. You know, the person that's screaming for gun control is doing so because they are scared to death. And the reality is, is they should be because they are dying to death instead of having an expectation of living forever. And we know the answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, we'll talk about that later. But let me tell you about this first. Let me tell you what really happened. You know what? You could be such a champion in your, in your workplace and in your, room of, your area of influence that you have. All right? Go in and go, guys, I found out what really happened. What? He had a sinful heart. It wasn't restrained. Nothing restrained his heart. He didn't have a moral factor. He didn't have a, he, he didn't have a character factor. He didn't have anything that restrained him. There was no good within him, and because there was no good and there was no restraint, then the evil that is naturally within him came out and manifested in this way. And there's a way to overcome that evil. You've got to have a heart change. We've got to See it happening from the inside out. That's what we do. That's how we fight this evil. Is we fight it with the only weapon that will stand against it, and that's the love of Jesus Christ and the salvation that comes through Him. One last thought, and we'll close on this. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I've looked at the faces and watched the slideshows. And, man, those were just folks. <laughs> they were just folks. Just like we're just folks. Went out to a concert. Went out to enjoy life. And were confronted. Now, I would hope and I pray and, and I'm, I'm confident that amongst those that, that, that were, were killed that some were believers. And from the moment that their life stopped here, they stood in the presence of a loving Savior that received them and brought them in. But I also know that it's a good chance that some were not. And their life was changed immediately for eternity based on evil. Guys, we don't have tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next breath. But we are promised eternity through Jesus Christ. That's the answer. That's the solution if we'll embrace it. Amen?